Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a, a 25 pound plate, and we'll go out on the turf, and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Talk Talk. I'm your host, Rob McKeever, and this is episode number 295. I want to thank you guys for listening each week. Truly appreciate those of you that like, share, comment, uh, leave ratings and reviews. It just helps us continue to highlight the great people that we have in our profession like Pat. Um, also want to recognize our sponsor for this year, Train Heroic. Um, great company, great people. Uh, if you haven't checked them out, go to trainheroic.com. Uh, great delivery system for your programming, but also a way to create some re uh, recurring revenue um, and just uh, a group that's constantly doesn't doesn't ever settle. They always try to continue to get better. So only partner with people, I believe, in both the people and the product. And uh, they are they are studs. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Pat Davidson. I was just talking about it off camera a little bit about how we've traveled in the same circles, but have never met and uh, super excited to get him on and He's an exercise physiologist, private strength coach, an author, a lecturer, uh, a strong man. I think you even competed in some some mixed martial arts, didn't you? I did, yeah. It's well, awesome, man. Well, but it's great. It's great to have you on the show, man. Really appreciate it. Well, hey, I always like to get in and talk about what happens in the trenches and uh, and just share share experiences. You know, I I love being in this world, and I love people that are kind of like you know in this for life and and love it. So. You know, to me, it's it's like I, I wanted to get in this to hang out with other strength coaches and to Likewise. be able to. Help. So, you know, this is always a pleasure for me. You know, I always say I always say that if we all lived on the same street, we'd freaking barbecue every night. You know, and it's unfortunate that we only get to see each other freaking once a blue moon. Yeah, conferences. But um, you know, Pat, I wanted to jump in. Um, you know, I always talk a little bit about past experiences, and you've kind of been kind of on your own. On, from the get-go almost, but, you know, which, out of all those things, exercise physiologist, private strength coach, you know, author, lecturer, I mean, I know they all blend together, but which which experience had the most impact on you as both a person and as a coach? You know, I, I, I think that I personally get more out of, of, out of living experiences. You know what I mean? Like, but it's hard. Like, they are all different. Like, you know, I've gained so much from being – from with general population clients that are kind of like your, your classical motor morons and like they don't prioritize exercise is the most important thing in their life. You know, I feel like if I can coach those people, I can literally coach anybody. Right. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a lot of kids when they first get into this gig, they just want to work with LeBron. And it's like, you know, first of all, you're not ready for that. Uh, and second of all, like if you really want to get to be a great coach, like <clears throat> start with people that, that are just regular people. Uh, right. Because, if, if you can connect with them and you can figure out how to get them to accomplish what you're looking for, then you're probably, you probably really know what you're doing because almost anybody, you know, I can, I can explain to something to somebody in, in the NHL and they can quickly replicate the, the thing that I'm looking for. But if I'm working with a, a 60 year old woman who's had a hip replacement or something like that, uh, who is more interested in baking than she is in, in trying to do a split squat, you know, then all of a sudden, like, I have to really be effective as a coach. So, you know, it's, it's, that's something I would never have expected, uh, you know, early on in my career that, like, my best teacher in terms of be, being a good coach would be working with those with the greatest limitations in terms of their ability to actually physically express the, the outcomes you're looking for. But to me, that's, that's been uh, incredibly rewarding and, and also just, you know, training and competing and things. Uh, there, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm always nervous when I get around weak strength coaches, uh, you know, and I, I, I see these guys kind of, they never existed 20 years ago. Right. They seem to exist more and more these days. And I'm kind of like, how did you even get into this field? Like I got into it because I had a lot of selfish interests in trying to be uh, a better athlete in, in the sports I was competing in. And I was looking for any edge I possibly could. And I would read anything I could, and I would try to train with people that were stronger and more athletic and more educated than me that would be able to, to teach me how to, how to get what I wanted. And I'm kind of always a little suspicious, like, well, what the hell are you looking for in this if you don't even like to train? So 
you know, I still surround myself with, with kids that are younger than me and stronger than me and more athletic than me, and I try to keep up with them. And I learn an awful lot about, you know, my aging body and, and really what's keeping it going and, right. uh, and what's working and what's not working and what's sustainable. So, you know, living it, I think, is, has been my biggest, biggest instructor over time. And I'm not trying to downplay books. I mean, I, I right. never stop reading. I never stop with the formal education. But if you don't live it, then I, I, I worry about you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, going back to what you said about kind of the motor, motor morons, I mean, you know, walking, the, not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time and, and working with different populations, that it doesn't come as easy to. I mean, I, you know, when we adopted James from Honduras, you know, he, he has a, he's got, um, he's got a traumatic brain injury and, and, you know, I, you know, I've coached the best of the best, right? But then turn around and I'm trying to teach him how to, how to jump rope and I'm freaking, I can't even teach him how to jump rope. And it's like, I, I had to go back and really break it down. And it did make me a better teacher just in the, even that, in that one instance. Uh, but then going around and uh, echoing what you said about living it. And I don't, I don't think you have to be the strongest person in the world for sure, but you better, you better find, you, you better be finding something that you can compete in throughout your entire life that you you're setting that goal and you're working to achieve that goal and, and, and you're putting out and building a process for your own self. Because I mean, a lot of times you want to make you want to, you want to try things on yourself, let you be the trash, the crash test dummy on some things. And uh, before you, 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 you'll put it on your athletes, I think, but yeah, I agree I, with that. You know, you know, I was, you, know you want to avoid drinking too much of the Kool-Aid that uh, that's in the bubble that you work in. You know right. what I mean? I feel like a lot of people stay in their bubble and they never see what's happening outside of their little spectrum. And Hey, a lot of things work, man. And, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people in, in the performance world that try to poo poo what other people are doing. But when you put your ass on the line and you're actually competing and, and you go against people that are training with methodologies that you might not agree with, but they're getting the same results as you, you know, you have to all of a sudden start to question things on a deeper level and just open your eyes a little bit more. And I, like, I, it's, it's made me a lot more open-minded. I, I can tell you like just competing in strongman and, and coaching kids and competing myself and, and getting, get my butt kicked by guys that were like coal mine, Ducky, who, who <laughs> they, they weren't following like some conjugate method, uh, periodized program. They were just tough, strong dudes that put in the work and were mentally tough. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, you have to just – you have to be open enough with yourself to, to not drink your own Kool-Aid too much. Uh, that's, that's just, again, valuable, valuable for me. I, I echo that 100%. Absolutely. We always ask on the show, you know, what your biggest mistake was and how you've learned from it. Hmm, that's uh, – I mean, I, I, I feel like I have lived a life that's been full of mistakes. You know, I, like – the big, the biggest one, boy. I don't know if I, if I can even begin to qualify that, but uh, you know, I, I had a lot of issues as a kid. Like I had some substance abuse issues. I, you know, the the house that I was raised in was not the greatest one. Um, you know, I, I, I think that just, uh, you know, the guy that took me in and coached me in mixed martial arts was like a, a surrogate father to me, and uh, and he was able to really square my life away and to to point me in a direction. And, he, he, I guess, I guess the biggest mistake I made was I didn't know how to work hard in anything else other than like actually like physically training and competing in physical things. And, and he put into my head the attitude of, listen, you know how to train, you know how to diet, you know how to fight, you know how to do all these things. Imagine if you took the same level of focus and intensity and you directed it at school. Yeah. And he convinced me that that was something that was possible. And as soon as I took that mindset and directed it at new things, all of a sudden it was like, I actually can read and write at a pretty high level. Right. And I, I can do all these other things. And, you know, I just simply have to, it, it's real easy to be lazy. It's real easy to, to, to kind of make excuses for yourself and shortchange yourself. But if you actually bring everything you've got towards the things that you're pursuing, you, you can be amazed at what you can do. And, and I think that I, I was just a lazy kid with a million excuses and a ton of bad habits. And, you know, I needed someone to be in my face and to, to 
really just pointed out to me and, and to get me to believe that I actually could do it. So what a, uh, what a great message. What a great message. And, you know, this goes back to what we all got into coaching for, I think, is to make an impact on people and better, pe better people make better athletes. And I, I firmly believe that, you know, and, yeah. and what a great, great um, story. You know, with um, I've heard you mention, you know, uh, you know, thinking categorically, and and you know, the you know, and how that, you know, that, that's it's assumed that that's good programming, but there's there's good and there's bad. I mean, what what, what do you mean by that? So I, I would just say that, like, uh, you know, if you ever go into a commercial gym, you know, around the holidays or something like that, as a as a coach, as someone in this field, you'll get yourself driven crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe you fish off some bets. Yeah, like you watch like regular people go through a commercial gym workout and you're like, what are you trying to accomplish? <laughs> like, what, guys, like, what in the world is going on? And, and it's, it's in large part because they don't have any kind of a categorical model in their head. Right. And, and to me, it's like successful programs throughout the history of, of exercise have been categorical in nature. And um, whether you're talking about bodybuilders who actually have like, you know, specific <laughs> body parts that they're working on on certain days that they pair together or whatever it may be that they they put their thing together or you know for me as a as a massachusetts guy getting exposed to mike boyle's methods of having a linear day and a lateral day and he's got tissue preparation on a linear day that's for muscles that move you in a straight line forwards and backwards and the, the strength is on those linear muscles and and the conditioning is as well and on that lateral day it's it's like everything that would move you side to side you're foam rolling your adductors, you're stretching those things, your conditioning is going to be on a slide board, we're going to do agility side to side, uh, we're going to work in lateral squats and things of that nature, like, it was very categorical, and, and for me, like, I, my brain loves that kind of stuff, you know what I mean, like, you give me boxes to be able to check off and plug things into, yep. and I'm really happy, because I've got a lot of scientific training, and a scientific background, and, and, and that's really, uh, one of the, like creating a taxonomy, like I always go back and talk about Carolus Linnaeus in seminars I teach, and people are like, who? Uh, I'm like, he's not Mendel, that's the P guy. Uh, Linnaeus is the guy that came up with the taxonomy for life with a kingdom right. of genus, you know, and, uh, and I can tell you exactly what every kind of animal is because I can put it in a box and it's, I can categorize it. Um, and generally speaking, that's been the progression of exercise. And, you know, we have like hip dominant, knee dominant, pushing pulling and i can come up with an exercise that fits into that category so I, you know i don't have to be one-dimensional i don't have to fall in love with an exercise not all my athletes don't have to barbell back button barbell bench press they have an issue i can add a swiss bar i can have a safety squat bar a goblet whatever it may be that fits into that category but at the same time i think that you have to be aware that complex phenomena like human biology and physiology cannot be limited down to the point where it's so reductionist that you think you're accomplishing everything just because you checked off these imaginary boxes. Great. And I, I think as long as you have, you can acknowledge and be aware of the fact that you will never be able to actually check off everything that exists because it's too big and it's too dynamic in nature and will never really understand it in truth. Uh, but you do your best to try to account for everything that you're doing a really good job. Um, so it's like one, it's a thing that is, it's great. It's like bumper bowling and you're more likely right. to knock pins down, but you just have to be aware of the fact that there's probably pins you don't even know about. Well said. I mean, well said. I think, you know, it's funny cause you, you get a young coach in and, and you give them, you know, a basic template and, and you know that, you know, that's, you know, that's going to be fa fairly safe and it's going to be fairly, it's going to accomplish 90% of what you needed to do. But then you test them somehow, some way, and you remove an element, a modality, or you remove uh, time or something along those lines. And all of a sudden you can see the steam coming out of their ears, like short circuiting on, on things. And it's not, I mean, it's not that, it's not that complicated. It's not rocket science. And, um, uh, sometimes you have to think outside of the box, you know, and that's, that's how growth, that's how growth occurs. And I, I, I mean, well, yeah, I really, I really identify with what you said there. You know, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, sensory motor matching and, uh, for proper biomechanical. I love this because, you know, I mean, so many times as an athlete, I've been, you know, in a, in a position where I feel comfortable 
but I've got a coach in my ear screaming at me about how, you know, my, my shoulder blades aren't pulled back just quite enough or my knees are a little too far, you know, at a, at a, at a, my, my shin ankles are a little bit further than what they want it to be. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and why it's not so black and white there. Yeah, you know, I think um, I'm sure somebody else came up with me, came up with this idea before I kind of put out this term of, of sensory motor matching. And and I, I believe that biomechanics is a neurologically phenomenon. And when I think about the nervous system, I, I kind of go up the hierarchy. And at the top of the nervous system is the central nervous system. At the top of the central nervous system is the cortex. And when I think about a cortex, I have a sensory co cortex and a motor cortex. And those feelings and perceptions, that afferent information in large part, uh, feeds forward into the efferent outflow of the motor system. And, you know, and, and when I think about great athletes and, and the way that they talk about things, you know, it's like uh, I'm sure that if you work with Steph Curry someday, he, some days he's feeling it, and it's like he knows the ball's in as soon as it leaves his hand. Right. And, you know, a, a pitcher in a bullpen before they go out into the game, they know on days where they're not feeling their curveball. They just don't have a good sense of it. So, and, and most coaches, whether we know it or not, are oftentimes coaching our athletes from a sensory perspective. You know, we're, we're trying to give them an idea of what to feel or what kind of intent they're supposed to have with what they're trying to do. But uh, I'm always looking at things from the perspective of like uh, the most basic fundamental levels of science, like the three planes. And, and I've tried to create a um, objective checklist in the way that I coach where I pair what you should be looking at as a coach and seeing and what that should feel like for the athlete from the perspective of sagittal plane, frontal plane, and transverse plane. Right. And the one to talk about is the sagittal plane. And I usually, you know, when I'm teaching this stuff or talking to coaches, I, I always ask like, Hey, what's the point of a human being having sagittal plane muscles? And the answer that I'm always looking for is that those muscles are there as anti-gravity muscles from the perspective of not falling on your face or not falling on your back. Right. Um, and I need when you're doing a sagittal plane drill for you to find and feel pretty specific sagittal plane muscles for me to feel confident that you're doing this right. Like it should look right to me as a coach, but I need to I, like I, I check my ego at the door because I can't see it all. And I want feedback from the person I'm working with as to whether or not what they're feeling corresponds to what I think I'm seeing. And when I get as close as I can to a match of what I want them to feel and what I want to see, I believe that I'm accomplishing the task of, of getting the exercise done right. So when I'm talking about what you should feel from a sagittal plane perspective, I'm always talking about heels. I'm always talking about hamstrings and I'm always talking about abs um, because hamstrings ultimately attach from the tibia to the ischial tuberosity and they basically prevent your pelvis from falling forward in space, they're a great muscle to prevent the, or the human from falling on the face. And abs are a great muscle because they attach to the rib cage and they attach to the pelvis. They prevent the thorax from just tipping backwards uh, and falling on the ground. So abs prevent you from falling on your back and hamstrings prevent you from falling on your face. If I've got both of those muscles working at the same time, you should stay in the middle. Yeah. And... And, and usually when people aren't feeling one or the other, it's because their center of mass isn't in the right place. And when I get people to feel their heels more, I think I'm putting their center of mass right in the middle. And I think that usually it corresponds with, uh, with them feeling the right thing and the exercise looking the way that it should. Um, and it's like a, a, a troubleshooting thing. Like, hey, not enough hamstrings, probably not enough heels. Uh, not enough heels probably, you know, you're probably not feeling any hamstrings or abs. Right. But, you know, it's kind of like if I've got if I've got people squatting and I want them, you know, to get abs, usually I'm trying to get hands to go forward. So I think it's why everybody loves the goblet squat so much. I put the load in front of you and your hands in front of you. If I move my hands forward, it shifts the center of mass backwards. If I move the hands backwards, it shifts the center of mass forwards. So it's going to be much harder for me to be able to to get those muscles you know, a back squat's a lot harder than a goblet squat. Great. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, I, I love the transformer bar, or the safety squat bar, or whatever. You know, it's got the handles that go out in front so you can reach your hands forward. It keeps your weight back on your heels. So I, I always, you know, I create these sensory motor uh, matching pieces, and then I try to think of the easiest 
piece of equipment that I can use to get what I'm looking for with the least amount of coaching, quite honestly. Uh, and, and for me, it's kind of like a good example is like uh, the safety squat bar. The tr I, I personally like the transformer bar that, that yeah. just, I mean, that thing's been the, the biggest money maker in the world. I yeah. set the handles so they're way out in front. People's hands are way out in front. I don't even say anything to them during their set and they get done and they're like, oh my God, my abs are smoked. <laughs> and I'm like, perfect. Just keep doing what you're doing. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's just a, uh, that's that's what I'm shooting for, but I, I just really do believe that that uh, it's got to look right and it's got to feel right. And if I can combine both of those things, even if I'm asking you after the fact, some exercises I'm not I'm not asking you during it. I don't want to ask you in the middle of a power clean, but after you look, you know, most people are like, "Oh, that felt good today, man. I'm I'm popping." Right. And like, yeah, that looked pretty good too. That bar path looked good. You know, we have all kinds of motor competency things, like whether it's dart fish or coaching eyes or video. But, um, you know, coaches have done a good job analyzing motor for a long time. I'm just trying to give a more objective checklist for, for all the activities that you can do in all three planes uh, from a sensory perspective. Yeah, I think that uh, what I really liked about what you said there was, I mean, obviously you're using modalities and your and positions to get that to get that information back from the athlete. But more importantly, you're asking them specific questions and based off that feedback, you're addressing the situation. And um, too many times we would just want to sit there and walk up and down the line and say, get on your heels, squeeze your shoulder blades, you know, and drive. And, and it's, it, there's no back and forth. It's only kind of one way communication. And um, to, to be able to understand what's actually going on within an athlete. I mean, it's, it's, it's bigger than just looking and seeing, and that's one piece, but it's, it's so much more than that. So I, I agree with you hundred percent. You yeah, it's like a coin, you know what I mean? It's just the two sides of the coin. Yeah, totally. And totally. If you're only if you're only playing with the tail side, like there's a whole other whole other world that you, you can open up for yourself to make your life easier too. Right. So right. That, that, that's why I'm trying to do it for people. It's like, yeah, you might have to learn a little bit, study a little bit, uh, get out of your comfort zone for a minute. But trust me, you, you kind of pick up some of the tools from that side of the tri of, of 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 the world and and Man, my job as a coach gets easier and easier, quite honestly. Agreed. You've spoken quite a bit about kind of the debunking, the the, the hormone hypothesis for hypertrophy, you know. Mm. I, and a lot of lot of material out there. Kind of give a quick summary and what you know, what do you mean by debunking? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, you know, I mean I, I, I got a PhD in exercise physiology. I took a whole graduate level course in, in neuromuscular physiology. We spent uh, weeks going through synthesis and, you know, mobilization and activation, utilization of, of every major anabolic hormone. And, uh, you know, I feel like a lot of guys spent their career uh, measuring this stuff and, and, and seeing what, what kind of sets and reps and times would, would lead to the biggest growth hormone and cortisol and testosterone spikes. And, and hey, that's the ticket, man. If you need to grow tissue you got to get the biggest GH and test responses that you possibly can. And uh, it's kind of like all the newer research and meta-analyses saying, if hormones matter, it's so insignificant, you can just throw it out pretty much completely because there, it's not enough time under the curve is this term that the, the science guys use. Right. But it basically means that if you do get a, a growth hormone response or a test response or a cortisol, whatever it is that you think you're getting hormonally, it spikes at about an hour. You know what I mean? You're doing your workout. You're in your workout. You're going to spike in an hour. And that thing is right back down to baseline. It's not elevated enough for long enough to do anything. Um, compared to actually like taking exogenous testosterone where it's elevated, you know, four times above what you could normally produce. And it stays that way for an entire week. Um, so it's, we fell in love with, with hormones. And I'm sorry to say to that are in love with hormones, they just don't matter that much. Um, you know, what matters is mechanical tension and volume. A little bit of metabolic distress, but I mean, way, way, way on the back burner. And I, I don't like saying it. I wrote two books. I wrote Mass and Mass 2. And a lot of the first book was based on sets and reps and rest periods that would correspond with the like, hormonal uh, recommendations for growing tissue. And uh, I was wrong. And, um, and I'm, I'm okay with that because I have an open mind and I'm scientific in my philosophy. Right. 
when guys like Brad Schoenfield come along and have meta-analyses behind them, um, you, you, you better kind of take their word for it. And it's not their word. It's, it's, right. it's science marches on. Exactly. And, you know, it, you're, you're, you, you've got to, you know, like what I like is the scientists are still talking about words like effort. And, um, you know, you've got to work your butt off to the point, you know, th those sets need to be really hard. You got to go right to your limit and you got to do it a bunch of times if you're really going to grow tissue. But don't think it's the, the hormones driving the show. They're almost like uh, if you had a car accident and you'd end up with like a traffic cop there to direct people around the mess, but the traffic cop isn't responsible for what happened and they're probably not cleaning up after either. They're just there to, to do a task. They're, they're kind of like a, a witness on the scene almost. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I mean, you've got a certain you know, concoction of a soup there that, you know, is marginally affected by these outside ind indicators. And you can spend your time really diving into that for marginal gains, or you can just go with what's proven, at, you know, mechanical tension and, 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 you know, working effort and intensity and whatnot. And, and now you've got an opportunity to maximize the genetic potential that you have. Um, yeah. And I, I agree with that. You don't have to freak out about some blood test that probably doesn't do as much as you think it does. You know what I mean? Like, Agreed. oh, you've got slightly below average testosterone. Well, I mean, in my own personal life, the guy I know that's like, he's a natural bodybuilder and he looks better than anybody else I know in the, in the world that's actually natural. And he's got some of the lowest testosterone levels I've ever seen on blood tests over and over and over again. Right. And, you know, it's just what he is, and it makes no difference. So it's like uh, we got kind of like sold a, a line that, that seemed really plausible. And I think a lot of it is just because of the ama amazing effects that drugs have. Yeah. But, you know, when you, when you talk about drugs, it's totally different. Yeah. Uh, but normal human ranges for physiology. Uh, and it's almost like for women that blame thyroid stuff for why they gain weight, it ain't the thyroid. You know what I mean? The hormone hypothesis is, we can basically say it has been debunked. It ain't driving the show in terms of changes in body mass the way that we thought. Yeah, I agree. Agree. Well said as well. Well, I want to get to some of these questions. If you guys got questions below, we're going to start to do a quick lightning round here. Just quick answers, Pat, on some of these questions. But um, Casey asked, you know, he just says, he asked if you've ever gone down the rabbit hole of thermodynamics and quantum physics and just how it relates? Um, I mean, thermodynamics is being, you know, like, like the basic, basic laws of, of like, you can't create or destroy it and everything's heading towards entropy. Sure. I mean, like I have, like, I, I like, I like basic physics and I, I like that kind of stuff. Um, I, it's, it's interesting, but I don't know other than like, you know, the fact that like dieting is going to work due to calories in and calories out. And like, you can, you know, there's no magic, you know, there's no insulin fairy. There's none of that stuff. Like a lot of diets that, that they work because they were, they, they create barriers and you like, can't have certain foods. And just by not having certain foods, you would end up with less calories, but there's no magic. So I do like the basics of, of things like thermodynamics because it ultimately, it, it tells you what the constraints are and what reality is. And then when you think you have something that's magic, it's never magic. It's always just like, it, it's fitting within the paradigm of, of that. So it's really important for people to be aware of, but you can, you can ultimately get lost. It's almost like a race car driver doesn't necessarily need to know every component of the engine and the, the way that a race car works. They, know, they need to know enough to be able to drive it. And I, I've probably gone uh, farther in than I needed to. <laughs> right. right. Uh, Cody Gerhard asks, yeah, after years of coaching, what's the one thing you wish you knew better as an athlete? <sighs> Everything. Um, <laughs> you know, like uh, I, I – I, Probably things in the frontal plane. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm critical of other, other coaches because I don't think that many coaches uh, really are, are, are tremendous at coaching the frontal plane. I, I think that there's, there's just some, like all I ever see are like lateral band sidewalks and, and, uh, and side shuffling. And, and I don't think that those are really training the frontal plane the way that the frontal plane is meant to really be trained. I think the frontal plane is about keeping the center of mass uh, inside the feet. 
uh, and, and to be able to shift side to side, but to essentially keep your skull over your pelvis uh, while you shift to the left and while you shift to the right. And, and oftentimes you see that in great athletes and you'll see it in like NBA guys that can cross over dribble. And it's like, how did they shake that guy so hard? Or, or how did Barry Sanders make that guy look so stupid on that cut? Because they're able to control center of mass. They're able to control the pressures inside their thorax and the fluid uh, that's shifting around inside the, 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 the thorax as they move side to side. And, um, you know, it's just, it's difficult to explain it without having people in front of me doing exercises. Right. But, you know, I try to cover those things in, in most of the talks that I give and the, the products that I offer and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I, I had no kind of frontal, it was just sagittal and I couldn't rotate or shift. Um, I'd be really good at going forward for, uh, you know, six seconds tops. But you ask me to change directions or something like that and forget it. You know, yeah. great athletes can rotate and shift. And the rest of us are just kind of like uh, sagittal fools in some ways. Gavin asks, you know, what's the relative strength goal for a frontal plane? Uh, totally unknown because I don't think that we really uh, – it's, it's probably like, for instance, like, uh, you know, my, my – Recently, for a, a 10 rep max back squat test for me, I was able to squat 465 with with pretty good depth. And uh, when I do a frontal plane uh, squat on the Kaiser that I've got, like I have the air pressure at at 40 pounds, and it absolutely roasts me. So, uh, you know, it, like I I don't know if anybody has an answer for that at this point. It's too it's too new for for me to be able to to think about it in that terms. Just be able to actually. Do it, number one. Right, green. What about uh, carry on? Ask what what to attack. You know, what's your what would be your advice for somebody that's just graduating, out of you know out of grad school? Obviously, the knowledge that you have was you know there's a foundation that's built in grad school and, and advanced learning, but obviously you know you've gone on from there and continue to learn and continue to refine your your craft. What would be your advice for somebody just, just getting out of grad school about going and becoming the same type of coach as you? You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a weirdo. Like, I don't have a typical path. Uh, you know, I always think, like, like one of my uh, – the, the person I probably look up to more than anybody else in the field is Bill Hartman. And, um, you know, I, I've learned so much from Bill. It's ridiculous. And I, I, I would – you know, Bill, Bill's recommendation on these kinds of questions is always get a great mentor. And, and that was typically what I tried to do with, with my grad students coming out of Springfield College was um, I, I always liked sending people to Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning because they were going to get exposed to a lot of great young coaches talking about a lot of great things popping up in the field. And they were going to coach a ton of athletes, particularly in the summer. You know, they're going to coach hundreds of athletes every single day, day after day after day. Um, and they're going to be around, you know, Mike and, and they're going to be around veterans and, and they're going to get exposed to a ton of continuing education. I, 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 it's like, you gotta be lucky sometimes. I feel like I kept bumping into really great people and I kept my ears open to what they were saying. Like, Hey, you got to check out uh great cook. You got to check out DNS. You got to check out PRI. You got to right. check, uh, West side Barbo. You got to check out. So I've just like have looked into pretty much everything and i i um i've tried everything so it, it just, just get exposed to a lot of stuff uh and work under some some masters i love mike boyle's analogy about cooking and like you know he's he's a top of the line chef and if you're just getting into the field like you're not ready to be a chef you need to be like a short order cook and you're going to do that in an internship program and you're going to just short order cook somebody else's recipes and you, you need to cook those recipes for a while until you can do it with your eyes closed. And now maybe your time to be like a sous chef and then you spend time there and you work your way on up the line until you are one day your own master chef. So mentorships, uh, surround yourself with good people, um, explore everything you possibly can. Uh, once you find something that you really think is, is gold, go in on that hard and go deep and you'll learn what it takes to master something. There's like superficial exposure, but then mastery of one thing. And I think people need both of those. Agreed. Well, guys, we could, we could go forever on these questions, I'm sure, but maybe Pat will jump into the, the comment section um, and answer some of these as well. But 
we end the show with a couple of resources, Pat. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. Oof. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I, from what I've learned in the, in the trenches and, and, and all that, like, and, and again, I go back to Mike Boyle. Like, I, I've listened to so much of him. I think he's a great guy, and I think he, he, he really says what's actually on his mind. He doesn't, right. he doesn't bullshit any of that kind of stuff and you know it's a per it's a it's a people business like you have to be a nice person and you have to connect with people and if you can't do that you can be the smartest person out there but you're going to be a terrible coach and I've seen some kids that are super smart and come out of school and they're like you know straight A students and like uh, they can like recite the genetic code or something like that <laughs> But, you know, you put them in front of somebody and they freeze yeah, up and, yeah. you know, it's like you better learn how to how to be a person oriented coach because you're going to be dealing with people for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, that's a that's a skill that you need to acquire. That's that's not something that you learn in kinesiology class. You know, you got it is not. You just got to get out. You got to get out and do it. No doubt about it. I was terrible in the beginning, working with people, you know, yeah. like I really, what the hell to talk to them about. You just get better at it by, yep. by doing it. Yep. I agree. Give us a uh, book app and website recommendation. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I, it's like, uh, books are always hard. Cause it's kind of like, what, 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 what are people interested in? Uh, you know, I, I, I just recommended triphasic training to a, a younger coach that, um, that's working with me in New York. And I, I think that's a great book. Uh, if you like training and, and um, you know, you want to get exposed to a system that is utilized and has been utilized by a lot of people and is very effective. I think Cal Dietz did an amazing job with that book. Um, it'll expose you to some great stuff. So I'm going to go with triphasic training today and uh, a website. Uh, I, my, my very good friend, Ben House, has an incredible website that will expose you to a ton of stuff that maybe you never heard of or knew about, but he's also a, a, a tremendous scientist in the world of nutrition. He has a PhD from, from University of Texas, and he is at Functional Medicine Costa Rica. Um, I just, it, you will not get more free quality information that is evidence-based anywhere on the internet compared to what, what Dr. Ben House is, is dropping on his website and on his social media. Yeah. Uh, regarding apps, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even really use apps. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty brutal on that front. Like, uh, so I, don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Instagram. Go with Instagram. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good, man. Well, hey, man, I, I, I hate to, to jump off because I think we could go all day, but it's easy to see why, you know, all the people that we, we were mutually friends with thank the world of you and, and just the amount of knowledge and I mean, that you're rattling off just from the cuff and, um, you know, the expo I, I love the approach. I mean, so many people want, you know, the elite athletes, so many people want the, the, you know, the sparkle, but you're willing to train anybody and everybody that steps in front of you and make them a better version of themselves. And, that's ultimately what we're on this planet for. So um, I think that, you know, I think the world, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing with everybody. Ron, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. It's, it's been great to, to kind of meet you on this and uh, I look forward to meeting you in person at some point. Likewise, man. Well, but before we jump off, let everybody know where they can go to, to, to learn more about you and uh, to stay up with what you got going on. Sure. I've got uh, drpatdavidson.com and, and that, Basically, we'll link you to everything I've ever done anywhere. Uh, I got a couple of books, uh, Mass and Mass 2. Uh, people have really enjoyed training with those, those templates and reading the stories in them and the, and the science. It's kind of like, a, like I, I've tried to make them like, like books combined, combined with training manuals, combined with like almost graduate level uh, exercise physiology information. And um, so far, they've, they've really outperformed anything I ever thought they would do. No, that's awesome. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for everybody that's watching. And uh, this will live in the story, so share it out with everybody. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Pat will pay attention to some of the comments and maybe get back to you on some of the sure. questions that we didn't get. But thanks so much, man. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Have a great day.
That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shop Talk.